Welcome to our panel on community connection co-creation, making customers your superpower. Most firms don't come close to realizing the immense potential of their customers to grow the business. We're not just talking about buying more stuff, paying you more money. We're talking about your customers knocking down, helping to solve your C-suite's toughest growth objectives, the ones that are keeping them up at night. In other words, engaging your customers to do things like organize 20 live events in 13 different cities that attracted 2,000 attendees in a successful effort to restore declining retention rates. That's a superpower. Or another firm's MVP customers, leading an effort to divert, uh, divert support requests away from the firm's expensive support center into its customer community. Now, a lot of companies' customers' communities are doing this, but how many are saving hundreds of millions of dollars like this one did? Superpower. One more example, lead user customers who co-created innovations that achieved twice the market penetration and 8x, eight times the revenue generated by internally created product innovations. Superpower. That's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be showing you how you and your team uh, your friend, your firm can take positive steps to turn your customers into a superpower as well. So let's meet our panelists. My name is Bill Lee. I'm, I'm the moderator. I'm the founder of the Center for Customer Engagement. Uh, we're in our 19th year. We've worked with many of the top B2B companies in the world. And I'm also author of the book, The Hidden Wealth of Customers, uh, and some uh, 20 other, 20 plus other articles with HBR. Jake Sorofman, our, our host, he's the president uh, of MetaCX, which is hosting this firm, former CMO of Pendo, which achieved unicorn status on Jake's watch. And he's also former vice president and chief of research at Gardner, among many other uh, accomplishments. Jill Rowley, former chief growth officer of Marketo, that ushered, helped usher that firm to its successful acquisition by Adobe. Uh, she's also been with a number of other really interesting MarTech firms like Eloqua, Salesforce. She sat on HubSpot's board and so forth. Jeff Ernst, former CMO of Forrester Research, currently the founder of Slap5. Very interesting new co company now in its sixth year, which sits on the boundary between voice of the customer and emerging communications technologies. So that's us on with the show. Jeff Ernst, got a question for you there. Are you there, buddy? I'm here. Thank you, Bill, for having us on. You're quite welcome. As I said earlier, most uh, companies aren't coming, most businesses aren't coming close to realizing the immense potential of their customers to grow the business. Why is that? Well, why is that? Well, there's a lot of reasons why, but I think all the reasons come down to the fact that they're just not aware of the art of the possible. And this goes both for the executives in the firms as well as the people running these programs. So if we look at it from the executive's point of view, when they think of engaging customers to help grow the firm, they think the classic things, right? Like the PDF case study, the reference program, the testimonials, things like that. And those are all things that make us feel good as executives, right? I, I kind of call those vanity assets, right? Uh, um, and then you think about the, the people that are running the programs themselves, that they tend to gravitate towards the tasks that they can control themselves without having to require a lot of cooperation from other parts of the company so that they can check things off their to-do list. And that's why they get really focused on peer reviews and gathering happy quotes and things like that, that that again, we're, we're not saying these are things you should stop doing, but they're not enough. I, I call those baseline activities that keep the lights on activities. But what we're talking about here today is elevating your game from that to really focus on mobilizing customers to support those strategic growth initiatives you have. And I think in, in order to get there though, you have to first, uh, you know, like, like there's a couple of myths that have to be broken. Like one, with all this attention that gets focused on peer reviews and you know, everybody thinks, and even executives think, oh, well, all we need is 500 five-star peer reviews and we're golden. But I've done over 2,000 buyer interviews, uh, both at Forrester and since. And you know, what I find is buyers, for example, they don't trust five-star peer reviews. They want to read the one and two-star reviews to really find out what's going wrong. What are the pitfalls I have to worry about? Same thing with overproduced testimonial videos and things like that. They don't trust them. They per perceive those as ads. So that's, but they're, they're still the vanity things. 
And, and so really what, what companies really need to start to think about is you know, identify what are those big strategic go-to-market initiatives that you have that the C-suite cares about. And if the people running the programs don't know what those are, shame on them, they should be meeting when regularly with the stakeholders that are uh, you know, losing sleep over these initiatives at night. And, and then really try to think about how and, and come up with strategies for how customers could be brought together either through customer to customer engagement or customer to company or customer to the market. And, and uh, because you know, anything that your company can do, especially as it relates to going to market, your customers can pretty much do better and more authentically and more genuinely and in a much more trustworthy way. And I know we're gonna get into some examples, oh, a, so I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, but, but I know there's lots of examples to, that will really bring it home. Well, that's a good point about customers can do. There's a lot of things customers can do better than our employees can do. And that's no knock on employees. Um, so that's, uh, I'm, I'm, I think that's a great point. Um, so let's say uh, you're in our audience and you're looking for kind of like, okay, where do, do they do they have to do a big reorg to get to the point where they can engage customers this way? Uh, is there a lot of warming up that has to be done that might take weeks or months before they can start doing this, or can they start right away? I'll take a crack at that. I I think that um, you certainly can't just uh, wake up one day and expect things to happen magically. You do need to create the right conditions and have the right sort of baseline programs in place in order to. Um, allow customers to work on your behalf. The way I think about it is, it's almost like how you should hire. You hire great people, you create the right conditions for them to be successful, and you, then you get the hell out of their way. And I think it's the same with customers. You hire customers who can be successful with whatever it is that you're selling. You create conditions for them to find success and also to sort of shout from the hilltops and work on your behalf, as Jeff said, um, with your company, with your customer, with your, with your other customers, with prospects, and then you get out of the way. And that does require some, some planning and some, some sort of work up front. Um, but if you're thoughtful about it and you approach that from a, a strategic perspective, you can create an environment where customers can go to work for you. Uh, hiring your customers, that's a, what an interesting concept. Um, but yeah. I mean, you want to be selective. Not just anybody can do these things. That's right. You know, one, one thing I would just uh, point out, maybe push back just slightly, is that a lot of the efforts that I see, uh, like some of the ones I just mentioned in the opening, uh, they, uh, the, the sequence was not that, for example, with a, with a firm that got its customer champions to do all this work to set up all these events to address the, the retention problem, it didn't start with, okay, we've got to uh, do all these things first. It started with the fact that it was an emergency. The president of the division was a little freaked out. Well, not just a little. Why all of a sudden the uh, retention rates were declining. So that was the genesis. That First of all, there was a very smart customer marketing program uh, who was in this meeting. He said, I think our customer champions can help with this effort. And then he went out and guess what he did? He started recruiting customer champions. He didn't have any. He knew he had good customer. Most viable firms have great customer advocates. Maybe not as many as they'd like. Maybe it's not perfect, but they'll have a, a significant number. He reached out to them and recruited them into this effort. Uh, and these were customers that believed in the firm and pulled this thing off. So I think there maybe there's two tracks here. The immediate need that the C-suite has that can't wait, and then, and then laying the foundation to really turn this into a true superpower that's done as a matter of course. hundred percent. That's a really good distinction. And I, I think of, as you're talking about that, I'm thinking of OKRs as a mechanism for creating alignment within your organization. What's an OKR but a way to create alignment across all your different departments around the strategic goals and priorities of your business. So to the extent that retention is identified as a strategic priority, it creates the opportunity for all the various functions and departments to align around that priority and create their own bottom-up plans in order to attack that priority. So um, I think that's a great distinction that you're making. It's A, shine light on the thing that matters most and create the right structure in your organization so teams can mobilize to attack it 
and then also create the more longer running um, capability within your company to start looking at these these uh, challenges more strategically. I was just going to say the way I'd phrase it, uh, like never waste a good crisis, right? I mean, uh, that's always a good way to have, uh, you know, to drive something like this forward. And I'll just give you a good example of one of the initiatives that I did at, at Forrester when I was uh, head of marketing there. Uh, you know, there, it was it was just a, a C-suite level initiative that we had to improve our retention rates. And, and like it is with any SaaS company or any subscription company in the, in the subscription economy, right? And so, um, and, and you know, as, as running a department there, I had to say, I need to make sure that I'm doing and pitching in and doing everything I can to help towards that corporate goal because that was you know, a board level discussion that we had every quarter. And so, you know, so again, it was a pretty, obvious exercise I thought was to look at what were all the reasons why people weren't renewing and then identify all the drivers of activities that were causing people to renew and then within each of those three drivers things like you know are they engaging with our analysts or are they reading our research or things like that we found very creative ways to have our customers tell their stories about the value that they were getting out of doing analyst inquiry or out of reading these reports or even better, talking about the types of initiatives that they were doing better with Forrester's help. And this was just such a way that, that this had far greater impact on renewal because it was educating customers on the value of the services that they were already having access to. And you know, so the company had tried for years using customer success managers and support people, trying to drive people to use more of the services they're entitled to, but it wasn't until we had customers helping customers get more value that uh, we really made a big dent and improvement in that uh, retention gap. Other thoughts, Jill, what do you think? Yeah, I, um, I've been eager to weigh in, but, but uh, mindful of, of the group. Um, I am very fortunate that I've only worked for one company that wasn't customer centric and customer obsessed. Um, as you mentioned, I've worked for Salesforce, Eloqua and Marketo and where the culture of customer centricity and being a customer led company, it really was at the C-suite level. And even when I joined Marketo in 2017, when we put together our, our strategic objectives for the business, drive growth, delight customers were our top two strategic objectives. And the mantra to rally us around these objectives were to listen to our customers, to learn from our customers, and to engage our customers, and not just engage them with us, but engage them in the ecosystem, in the community, in the partner network, um, in learning, right? We had, at Marketo had invested in a lot of great training and resources, best practices, uh, job boards, et cetera, to create this environment where customers were learning from each other, like Jeff said, um, and where we were listening to what they were learning and incorporating that into our strategy, into our product innovation, into our messaging, into the way that our salespeople were selling, all the way through to, you know, how do we onboard a new customer? How do we get them to value more quickly? Um, and and those, all those things feed into uh, retention and loyalty and therefore advocacy. So I, I would just summarize that it starts with the executive level buy-in. Why, why are customers um, strategic? Why are they uh, an engine for growth? And then what do we need to do to become more customer centered and centric? And then how do we actually do that? But if you don't have that at the top buy-in and, and understanding the value of investing in your existing customers, not just being drunk on new logo acquisition, then it will be a failed attempt. Love it. Couldn't agree more. And, and just to quickly weigh in on that, Jill, one thing you said that I think is is so powerful is sort of creating the conditions where customers can learn from each other. I think that is uh, one of the most important and, and most frequently overlooked parts of how we think about taking advantage of customer relationships 
I've learned so much more than customers than they've ever learned from me, and I'm sure that everybody on this panel would agree and feel the same way. Um, it's in incredible how much innovation comes from customers, and they can teach each other, they can uh, share their knowledge around sort of best practices and use cases that you as a company will never dream up. Um, and that's really, really where the magic happens. So I said, you know, creating the conditions where your customers can go to work for you and getting out of their way, that's the prime example of that. And I think that that's the, the real opportunity. It's that scenario right there. So let me take just a second here to kind of sum up uh, what we've been saying here, uh, that uh, this is about, in a sense, hiring customers. And by the way, somebody's probably saying out there, well, wait a minute, what do you pay them for doing this? We'll talk about that in a second. It's, it's much better than money that you get them. Um, but we're talking about, it starts with, this, with the urgency, with the C-suites, with the businesses, you know, crisis objectives that have to be addressed. Uh, and getting involved in those. Uh, and then the suggestion I have is that you take all your customer programs, customer marketing, customer success, all the customer engagement programs, and meet regularly uh, once a month. And the first item on the agenda is here's where the top priorities are. Here's what our C-suite's focused on. You should know these anyway, but that starts the agenda off. Let's start thinking about how we can address these. And if we don't know how, if we don't know how, let's, there's resources out there including us, they can show you lots of examples of how this can work. Uh, and then, and then uh, I think third is, as, as Jill said, uh, it's engaging customers, not just with us. Uh, and, 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 J and Jake picked up on this, engaging them with each other, how powerful that is. So why don't we pivot to that a little bit uh, and talk about how Connecting customers, first of all, it's something they want to do. It's the easiest sale you'll ever make to, to, uh, to put customers together. They'll ask you for this. Uh, so let's, let's kind of explore a little bit about how that, uh, how that creates, how that takes the workload, let's say, off your internal employees and puts it on the backs or on the, on the plates of the, of the people that can best deliver certain parts of the customer experience, and that's other customers. And the reason for that is because they have natural empathy and trust that employees, it's harder for them to establish this. Let's talk a little bit about how this uh, results in amazing things. And Jill, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you'd be interested in, in sharing your experience uh, back in the day when you set up Eloqua's awards program. Uh, that's the awards program, they're, they're kind of old hat now, but you did it in a way that was super strategic that I don't think uh, that awards programs, that I don't think many of them were doing quite the way you did it. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, there's so much that we did right at Eloqua. And I was there just for context. I was at Eloqua from 2002 to the acquisition by Oracle for about a billion dollars in 2012. Um, so I was there for about a decade, and um, we really were doing category creation. Uh, the, the marketing automation wasn't a category back in 2002. And if you've ever heard of Scott Brinker and the MarTech landscape with now over 7,000 technologies, um, he first published that in 2011, and there were only 150. So Eloqua was extremely early in its uh obsession on customers and things that we did 2007 was our first we called it the marquee awards and it was a, a, a an idea of our founder mark organ combined with our head of marketing at that time steve gershik and the idea was to we knew our customers were doing amazing things and like you said, use cases beyond what we could even dream up, Jake. Um, and so we wanted a way to actually get that knowledge, right? To, to learn from our customers and then to engage them in a way that um, celebrated their success. And so we had these, what we called marquee award programs and the customer and or the partner that they were working with would submit and they would be topic oriented, and then everyone in our organization was part of 
the review process and the rank ordering of the, the winners and the finalists. So we were all learning about our customer um, successes and the outcomes that they were driving. In addition to that, um, we would get our customers together. And this is the actual marquee award that our customers would get for if they won the category. This thing weighs about five and a half pounds and the customer would go back to their office and they would display this. They were proud of the award and the recognition that they had won, which would then in turn elevate um, Eloqua's uh, awareness within their organization. One of the things that we complimented that with, we would do that at our annual user uh, conference. And we would then have um, a showcase, uh, a red carpet, and we would have the customer stories on these huge like life-size boards where there were pictures of the customer and a summary of their story. Um, so that our other customers and our potential customers and our partners and our employees could all learn about the success of our customers. So let me, let me, if I could, I just want to insert here. So the dynamic you created was you've got these customers, your most innovative customers coming and telling you all about how they did it in ways that not only do they learn that other customers learn from them, but your internal people, your, your strategists, your, your C-level, uh, your, your product innovation people and so forth. They're getting these incredible ideas for innovations, changes to the product. You may, I don't know, did you change strategy at some point uh, with all this information that's flowing in? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so forth. So these are your customers driving all this stuff. Yeah, our customers drove our product roadmap, our product priorities and innovation. They drove our messaging and positioning in the market. They fed into, um, we, we learned that it isn't just what you sell, it's how you sell and why you sell. And so it fed into the way that we actually engaged during the buying process. And it certainly helped us understand um, what were the, the things that made customers successful quickly. And so we were able to feed that into the way we onboarded customers, um, the way that we mapped them to a maturity curve Absolutely. and the way yeah. that we, uh, you know, paired them with the right resources internally to you know, improve retention and expand our, our, our product offerings so that, and build products that they're willing to pay for. So it actually, it informed all of the areas of the business by getting this feedback from our customers and engaging them in ways that, um, that, that wasn't actually common in the market back then. So improving retention, improving uh, onboarding, improving adoption, improving products, uh, improving your strategy uh, and so forth. This is superpower stuff. And, and, and Jill, you were a groundbreaker there because so many companies then copied what you did with the awards program, right? Yeah. So that, that's the ultimate compliment there. And, and I'd just like to add, Bill, so, you know, fast forward now to 2020. So, so one of the things that I have been doing with all my clients, even before COVID, was really helping them engage their customers around some of the biggest topics or issues going on in the world or in their world today or in their industry today. And so, but now think about COVID. That's probably the biggest thing that's impacting companies today and especially back when it first hit and the shutdowns first hit in March. But what, what a lot of uh, forward thinking companies or proactively thinking companies were thinking here is what better way to help companies, their customers cope with COVID than for that company to be the ringleader, to bring their customers together, to help each other talk about what they're doing to react to or even take advantage of opportunities that exist or make the pivots that you need to make uh, as a result of COVID. And I'll give you good examples. I, I work with several ERP companies and they're all about business continuity. So they were all trying to figure out how do I enable a remote workforce or, or you know, people to work from home, have the equipment, make sure they're securely connected to our networks, that the finance people can do their thing, the HR people can do their thing, right? And, and so, 
by ERP customers, but they're bringing together customers, either capturing stories uh, you know, asynchronously or bringing them together on Zoom and things like that, to sharing stories about how they've been able to do that to ensure business continuity. You know, similarly on the HR side, I've got several HR software customers and they're all concerned about the cultural impact and employee morale impact of now this WFH, right? Now everybody's working from home and a lot of people uh, just don't know how to work from home or they don't have the self-discipline to be productive from home. But I think that has been largely overblown now that we've seen a lot of companies have done pretty well working from home. But, um, but, but still, uh, you know, those people, you know, who better than their HR software vendor company to bring those senior level HR professionals together to talk about how you ensuring that you, in, you maintain trust and relationships and a positive cultural environment and the collaboration that you need, despite the fact that everybody was just instantly dispersed and doesn't oh, see each other in person anymore. Well put. Uh, I'd like to, uh, boy, I wish we had more time. Uh, of course, we all, all panels, I guess, wish they had more time. Uh, I'm really enjoying this, but uh, let's pivot once more. Uh, Jake, I'd like to talk to you. We're talking about all these getting customers to do all these wonderful things, powerful things, being our superpower. Uh, but I think before you can really get to that state, I mean, you can start, uh, as we talked about earlier, pretty quickly. But to really get to where you've systematized this, institutionalized this approach into your firm, uh, I think we need to do a little soul work. We need to work on ourselves first. We need to work on the soul of the business before we can do that. So Jake, talk to me. Uh, is there such a thing as the soul of the business? Is it just airy-fairy stuff or is it real? I think, I think there's something to what you're describing, Bill. Um, wasn't it Mitt Romney who said something like, corporations are people. Um, I think he got a lot of heat for saying that, but I think the point he was, he was, he was, he was awkwardly trying to make the point that what is a company but the sum of its people. And, you know, we've all seen the research that, that suggests there's a positive correlation between uh, employee NPS score, ENPS score, and NPS score without opening that can of worms around um, the validity of NPS score as a measure of customer satisfaction. But there is a very close relationship between employee engagement and employee happiness and customer happiness. And what creates employee happiness? But really working toward a sense of purpose. You know, it's kind of like the whole uh, Simon Sinek concept of starting with why. It's not what you sell. It's not how you sell it. It's, it's why you do what you do. And really understanding that essence of what your brand is about. You know, Amazon is about taking the friction out of shopping. Zappos is about delivering happiness. These are just, you know, very well-known um, sort of statements of purpose, but um, companies that really, really walk that talk, and I'm not talking about cat poster wisdom. I'm not talking about platitudes because so often these things become that, but really something that speaks to the essence of what your company is about, what your value proposition stands for, what your differentiation is, and why you exist on the planet. And using that as a way to rally and mobilize your teams to really, uh, and without sounding completely high-minded about this, but work toward a higher purpose. And um, that, what that really starts with is making promises you can keep, you know, a brand that stands for something that you can consistently deliver. And of course, what happens over time is that companies often creep away from that purpose as shorter term and more uh, internally focused thinking starts to uh, compete with some of those um, those higher, higher level goals, their higher order goals. You know, when we're focused on uh, making our number for the quarter, when we're focused on a performance objective that we have as a team, as an individual, um, this can sometimes get in the way and it can create a bit of dysfunction. Um, not to mention as companies scale, you need to necessarily start to specialize. And as you specialize functions, you start creating silos. And as you, these things start to sort of um, the combination of these two things can cause the internal madness of your company, the internal madness of how things get done, to sort of bleed through where the customer can start experiencing that. And that's when we've, we've all as consumers had customer experiences that have gone way wrong, where we feel like we're, you know, 
we're experiencing the, the internal madness of the Soviet apparatchik. That's what I'm talking about. The bureaucratic sort of moribund process of large organizations that are just doing the wrong things to delight customers. And um, that's sort of what happens. We start with great intentions, and over time, as we evolve and mature, mature, we drift away from that initial sense of purpose. Well, can I just add on, I think one of the things is we get the attitude of, that's not how we do things here. And the reality is when I hear that, I'm like, great. I'm glad that that's not how you do it, <laughs> because it's time to actually rethink how we do things and actually think about it through the lens of what is possible, what is right and what is good for our customers. And I'll give one example at Marketo, we had a university and lots of great education, not just around the product, but that university was only accessible to paying customers. And I challenged the organization to open that up and unlock that to potential customers so that they could learn as well. And the pushback was, it, it's, it's technically really difficult. It, you know, how would we monetize this? And really it was putting together the, the business case for unlocking that will lead to greater sales because you will allow people to actually experience being a customer and learning from you before they actually commit to paying you money. So we have to rethink the way we make decisions as we get more, uh, as we get bigger. I love that. And, and I'll just point out, uh, it's no coincidence that this event is called the customer room. A customer room is an actual physical space within a company that's used to sort of um, display artifacts related to a customer, personas, journey maps, anything that adds color and context and dimension to the customer to make them real. And really the point of the customer room is to bring the customer back into the company. Because over time, as we grow, we we can lose sight of the customer. Um, and you start focusing on the internal aspects of how to run your business and to, how to do your job without really understanding and appreciating what you all stand for as a company. Um, I think it's really important and, and very hard to do. I'd like to add too, when, when the companies, There's... when companies remember their purpose, keep stick to their purpose, embrace their purpose and pull customers into that purpose it's amazing how magnetic it becomes. And it's amazing how much, how much people want to do business with companies where they believe in their purpose. You know, they have a purpose and they believe in it. And this ties nicely back to a, a kind of a, maybe a little joke that you made earlier, Bill, about, you know, what do you pay them, <laughs> right? And, and so, but, but that's, uh, that's not really a joke because I, I can tell you, when I was creating the Forrester Frontlines, which was our first customer engagement, customer voice program at Forrester, uh, a lot of people that had been in the company for 20 years or so were saying, well, well what are you going to pay them to participate? Or, 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 or how are we going to compensate them for that? We can't afford to pay them to do that. And I said, we're not going to, because I had already done the research with our customers around how, you know, the opportunities that we were going to present to them to engage with the company and with each other and with the market. And everything, and gave them lots of choices and, and, and types of opportunities and let them select what they were most interested in. And what they told us is they very much wanted to associate their brand with the Forrester brand, right? Because Forrester stood for challenging conventional thinking and making better decisions, right? Having the insight to make better decisions. And people feel emboldened by that. And, and so we never thought of you know, doing like the gamification approach or rewards or service credits or things like that. No, we, we won't with the intrinsic benefits of customers engaging, which is we're making them look like heroes. We're making them feel smart. We're making them feel successful. We're making them feel connected to the Forrester brand. And, and that's what people really want. And, and that's what I found drives this long-term engagement because the worst thing you can do is get into what I call the random acts of customer engagement, which is, you need a quote for a press release? Okay, you go beg 10 customers and you get one of them to give you a quote. Then a week later, you need a reference in this industry and it starts all over again. And then two weeks later, you need three uh, people to talk to Gartner for the magic quadrant and you go out and beg 20 people and hopefully get two, right? I mean, that's just the 
the worst you can be in. And, and so I think that all ties back to having a soul, having a purpose, and, and then you know, bringing customers into that. And the other thing I'd add to that is that we have a choice in who we hire as a customer. We have a choice in how we target. We have a choice in the promises we make. And then we have a choice in how we uh, organize uh, in the service of those promises to ensure that they find success with whatever it is we're selling. And to the extent that we have discipline and focus around uh, targeting the right uh, customers and promising things that we can consistently deliver on, and then focusing to ensure that they're successful with those promised outcomes. We can make them wildly successful, and when we make them wildly su successful, they will be asking you to participate, and you won't be doing what Jeff is saying. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting when talking about the problem of when companies lose their soul. <clears throat> uh, and this has happened to great companies. It happened to Apple uh, in the 90s. It's happened to Starbucks. It's happened to, uh, to, to, to many firms. Uh, Nike at one point. And what do they do? When they reach this point, is this is not something you can delegate down to somebody and say, "Hey, marketing, uh, we need to do some soul work here." Uh, you know, that's not going to work. And so, what well, the, the the successful approach to this? Bring back the founders, the repository of the soul of the original animating purpose for the firm. Bring back Steve Jobs. Bring back uh, Phil. Uh, 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 Phil, his last name is escaping. Knight. Phil Knight. Thank you. Uh, bring back, uh, you know, Howard Howard Schultz, uh, and restore the soul of this business. It's a CEO level uh, initiative uh, that has to be uh, that has to be driven uh, at that level. One thousand um, percent. Let's kind of put a, a, a bow around this a little bit. I think where we're what we're talking about, you can start right away. You've got the customers right now and right away to start uh, to start uh, addressing. These, these, these major priorities that your C-suite is sweating. Uh, you can probably start right away. There's an agile approach to doing this. There's an agile approach to creating uh, the, a better customer experience. You don't have to wait a, you know, months or a year to, to completely redo your whole rip and replace your infrastructure and spend millions of dollars. And so you don't have to do that uh, to make meaningful improvements to the customer experience, engaging your customers like we're talking about here. Um, so, you know, you can start right away. And then also, I think there is, there's a great career ahead for anybody who's in customer programs, who has leadership, uh, many of you in the audience, I think are leaders now, who has further leadership uh, ambitions. A great thing for you to do is to get clear on how to create the environment, uh, as Jake talked about, create the environment for your customers to not only succeed, but to help you succeed and to get into this incredible exchange of mutual value that just escalates like this. I have a concept I call a level four value proposition uh, that Jake was, in effect, that's what Jake was describing earlier. The level, the value proposition most firms are on now is a level one, it's transactional. Level four uh, is the sort of value proposition that great sold companies uh, achieve with their customers. Um, so other thoughts. Other yeah, I just other, have one thought on that. Shots. Yeah, but a thought on that, Bill, because the, 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 the champions for, at the, for the clients that I work with, they are those people that you describe, and, and that's what I help them do. You know, I, I advise them on that, just what you're saying. I mean, because if we could wave our magic wand, there would be a role in these companies where there would be this one person either on the executive team or tightly connected to the executive team who is deputized with all this authority to make all this happen that we've talked about. But we're just not there, right? And, and we may never get there or maybe a long time. But in the meantime, the, the people that are running customer programs are already playing leadership roles there who aspire to do better. You know, I, you know I, I coach them on, you know what, go talk, go have one-on-ones with each of the executives uh, in that C-suite to really find out what's on their mind, what are the top initiatives they care about. And you know what happens when they do this? They, they say, the executives will say to them, you know, nobody in a role like yours has ever come to me and asked that question before. Uh, it, you mean, you're, you're looking for ways you can help me? <laughs> and, and, the, and they're overwhelmed and they start to bubble with, uh, 
in issues or initiatives or challenges they're having in the market or whatever it might be, that then you can start to get creative. And, and, and so, so once, you know, we find, you know, from those executives or maybe get a couple of them together, you know, figure out what some of those initiatives are, then it's not that hard to start to craft together some programs that either bring customer to customer or customer to company or customer to market, you know, the three forms of engagement that we've talked about that then, you know, start to address those initiatives. I tell you, when you do that, that executive is now going to um, smooth out the bumps in the road, you know, anywhere in the company that you need to make that happen because you're now speaking that person's language. You're now talking about that person's MBOs and probably that person's bonus, right? You know, you're, you're impacting the metrics that that person cares the most about. And, and, and so, I mean, I've seen it happen over and over again. So I, I know it's possible and, but it does take, um, you know, that, that bold kind of getting out of the shell of that that's the uh, people that own these customer programs tend to live in, which is let me just manage the things that I can totally control myself and, and not try to go outside that bubble. So, so true. Gotta, gotta break that bubble. You know, uh, Jake talking about hiring customers, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, there was some research done by a former McKinsey consultant. Uh, <clears throat> and he, he did uh, the research was on uh, the kind of the class of, of 1980 through 2005, uh, the, the technology firms that really came to the fore in those years, Microsoft, <clears throat> excuse me, Oracle, um, uh, Amazon barely made it. Uh, well, no, not barely. They, they were cleanly in that group, uh, eBay and so forth. Uh, and he looked at the time, the ones that, that made it to a billion dollars in revenue. And what he found was there were seven common factors that they had, and the 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 most uh, the most powerful one was that they all engaged with marquee customers in their market. They pursued the potential marquee customers in their market. Uh, I mean, for Cisco, it was Solomon Brothers uh, that 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 got that, that got their start in the financial services industry in that market. Uh, Microsoft, of course, probably their big their big one was IBM, uh, and so forth. So they targeted. Uh, they didn't just you know take anybody that's got a buck or that you know whose, whose credit card you know clears. Uh, it was like who are the the marquee customers? The definition that he was using was they're the most innovative in the field. They're also the most influential. When people people will notice, people in your in the, in the rest of the market will notice when they start doing business with you. Um, and also, they were visionary. They themselves had a vision for where their industry was going. Well, think about what that does for the vision of your company that's serving that industry. And your, and think about vision just. Yeah, and, and sorry to interrupt you, Bill. Think about how how much discipline it takes to say no to business, particularly as a young company. Like that sort of focus, it takes extraordinary discipline to say, no, that company is not a fit. We're going to focus on this type of company because A, we're going to get more value out of that relationship because it's a marquee brand, but more importantly, because it, the, their need matches something that we can deliver on. Like being able to, right. to really home in on that and resist the temptation to, to lose that focus, I think is just incredibly difficult and, and, and somewhat rare. Just one more, like, because I come from the sales lens, um, I've always said that your best salespeople aren't on your payroll, they're your customers. And so you've got to invest in your customers as much as you invest in other functions of the business because your customers are a function of the business and they are the most trustworthy and influential uh, uh, to the growth, the new growth of your business. So uh, thanks for joining us uh, and thanks to the panelists uh, for, uh, for participating in such a rich conversation. So let's, uh, let's sum up what we, uh, what we learned here. Your customers are a potential superpower, an unexplored superpower. They're all Clark Kent now. Uh, and they're just waiting to blossom into super person, superman, superwoman uh, for your uh, for your firm. Uh, and the path to get there is, uh, I think, 
three or four takeaways that, that I think you can take away. You can start now with the best customers you've got. Uh, and you can start by, by doing what Jeff talked about. Go to your C-suite. I think uh, Kevin Lau did that, your protege at Marketo, Joe. Go to your C-levels and start saying, what, what can I do? What can I do to help, uh, to help you out? That really will floor them. Um, and, uh, and just remind them, we work. By the way, I also suggest you identify yourself with your entire customer program's effort. Don't come, on, don't come in and say I'm from the customer reference program. Uh, come, in, come in and say, we run the reference program and we formed a, 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 a consortium, an internal organization that includes customer marketing, customer community, advisory boards, customer success. Uh, that is, the, we call this customer programs. We want to know what we can do to help you, what our customers can do to, to help you. That's going to unlock a lot of, uh, of amazing conversations. Uh, and then start meeting regularly with, this, with your customer programs to start talking, how can we contribute to these difficult challenges our C-levels are, are experiencing? Uh, think of your customers not as just ATM machines. Think of someone with great skills that you don't have, a lot of which you don't have in your firm, which is fine. And think about them as if you're hiring them not to pay them money or the quid pro quo, but in terms of enhancing their experience, helping them to build their reputation in their industries, helping them build their careers in those terms. Uh, and finally, start, start setting the stage for long-term uh, institutionalization uh, of, of this kind of customer engagement. And that starts with some soul work, getting the soul of your business clear and maybe engaging your CEO. Uh, and conversations about what is our soul, why, what is our why with our market and our customers. So I hope you found this helpful. Thanks again for joining us. Signing off.